Have you ever lost your country to extremists? To religious conservatives who've changed the very fabric of your society? I have. In 1979, my family was forced to flee Iran after a revolution transformed that country from a secular state to a religious one. Now I see a disturbing trend in Israel that reminds me of what I lived through back then, a fundamentalist anti-modern religious minority that's growing at an alarming rate, entering into government and challenging the secular nature of the country. Will the ultra-Orthodox Jews transform Israel into a religious state? Or will Israel's secular Jews be able to maintain the democratic promise of the country's founders? I'm in Jerusalem to immerse myself in the world of the Haredim. Reza Aslan is an author and scholar. Reza Aslan is a scholar of religions. Best-selling author Reza Aslan. As a scholar, as a Muslim, as an American, what is your reaction? I've been studying the world's religions for 20 years. Now, I'm gonna live them. To be honest, there's a lot of conflicting feelings involved in being here. Because no matter what I say, no matter what I do, someone's gonna get pissed off. This contested piece of land is the quintessential third rail and you just don't wanna touch it because you can't win. And so, this episode is the one that is in many ways the hardest for me to do. Because although there is a big, huge, undeniable conflict here, we're here to talk about a completely different conflict. Not a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, but a conflict among Israelis over what it means to be a Jew in a state for Jews. At the founding of the State of Israel, there were about 30,000 Haredi. Today, there are more than 800,000. That's about 13% of the Jewish population of Israel. Part of that population surge has to do with their high birth rates. There are about six to seven children per average in a Haredi family. Some Haredi families have upwards of 10, 11, even 15 children by 2030 the Haredi population will be approximately 20% of all Jews in the state. It's also a relatively poor population. And that's primarily because men in Haredi households tend not to work. They spend their days studying the Torah, the Talmud, and the Jewish traditions. As a result of this, the Haredim take an enormous amount of state funding, welfare as we call it. And this has created an enormous amount of resentment among many secular Jews when it comes to the Haredi. They feel as though this is a community that takes and takes and takes from the state, but doesn't give anything back. You see, for the most part, every man and woman in Israel serves in the military for a couple of years. But not the Haredi. They have an exemption because they're studying in yeshiva. They don't have to serve in the military. So in the view of a lot of secular Jews, the Haredi are not sharing the burden of defending the state of Israel against its enemies. This wouldn't be a big deal if the Haredi more or less excluded themselves from Israeli society and from politics, but they don't. On the contrary, they've been voting in droves. They have their own political parties, the ultra-Orthodox Shas party, the Yahadot HaTorah. And as you can imagine, this has created an enormous gulf between the seculars and the ultra-Orthodox. This is May Sharim, one of the largest Haredi neighborhoods in Jerusalem. I was advised not to walk around here without a local escort, as outsiders are not welcome. 
and so I called up my friend Ari Aton, a theologian and public activist who grew up in an ultra-Orthodox family, and who now spends his time promoting dialogue between the seculars and the Haredi in Israel. I've heard that a lot of the Haredim, that their phones, even their smartphones, are either filtered or they're not even connected to the internet. Is oh, that true? Not, even, not only to the internet, there is this uh, concept of kosher phone. You can only make phone calls and not even receive text messages. It's all about keeping the, the world at bay. Exactly. It's all about that. What, what's all this? This is the internet. <laughs> this, is the place. this is the Haredi internet. Yeah, this is the portal. You have different announcements. For example, this one is an announcement of a rabbi that passed away. They are called uh, Pachkevilim. Pachkevilim. It's, it's an old word, I guess, from Yiddish. So these posters are just a way for an insulated community to communicate, communicate with exactly. each other. So I've heard that even with some of these Pachkevilim, they, they can actually be very personal in nature, almost like, you know, so-and-so showed too much leg, or, or, you know, something like that. Like, almost a shaming. Yeah, public it's, shaming. A, it's a low-tech style of shaming. So um, it's like a way of almost policing the, mora the morals of the it community. It is, it can be a sanction, yes. What's this? Oh, here it actually says, life is beautiful to those who smile. More uh, hippie style. So this is like the, this is like hippie Haredi. Yes, I would say that, yes. Huh. Yeah. That's funny. And here we go, another. we see more Pachkevili. You can see the handcuffs. It says, go to the prison and not to the army. Because if you go to the army, this is spiritual elimination. In recent years, laws have been passed to compel the Haredim into military service. But the implementation of those laws continues to be delayed. Partly this has to do with the power that the ultra-Orthodox have in the Israeli government. Yaakov Litzman is one of more than a dozen ultra-Orthodox members of the Israeli parliament. He's also the Minister of Health. From what I understand, your rabbi was the one who actually encouraged you to enter into politics. Did that create any conflict for you at all? We never have personal goals. We always have the goals from the rabbi. We have a council of sages. They tell us how to vote. Do you understand how that might concern some people uh, in Israel, that you are not really separating religion and politics? So that's their problem. So does the conflict. So what? No, but, I, but you're not just a Knesset member. You are also the Minister of Health, which means that your responsibilities are to every single so Israeli come, citizen, how, regardless of how, how they come, see the Torah. How come in the polls and the surveys, I was voted last week the best minister? And we're trying to make it that the, the nation of Israel should be a nation, which the Torah is the example. We are Orthodox people, and we do everything what the Torah says. But you would recognize that there are, of course, many, many, many Jews, perhaps millions of Jews in, in know, Israel never, who do I not I never, share your religious I, views. So, in the meantime, they live abroad, I live here. Well, they, no, have to I decide, mean, they have to decide what they want. I, I'm sorry, I, I mean actual Jews here in Israel so who, who do not Jews? see themselves. I don't think so. You are leaving out certain Jews and non-Jews who are Israeli citizens who may feel as though you are actually forcing your particular religion, uh, your particular views upon before, them. The Torah is the Torah. We obey the Torah. The land of Israel is because of the Torah. So what the Torah says that we're supposed to do. That's the reason we are Jews. We will never change. The Torah has never changed and we will never change. No. Whatever you are going to try to change, we will not let the change. We are against change. Haredim traced their roots to 19th century Europe, a time when Jewish leaders were encouraging Jews to assimilate into European culture, to adopt European values and traditions. In response, a group of conservative rabbis launched a movement that rejected modernity in favor of a strict interpretation of their most holy scripture, the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament.
They shut themselves off from the world, choosing to live in closed communities and dress in traditional garb that they felt allowed them to maintain a distinctly Jewish identity. All of this made the Haredim easy targets for European anti-Semitism, and they were almost completely wiped out in the Holocaust. Some who survived fled to Palestine. After the creation of Israel in 1948, the Haredim at first wanted nothing to do with politics or government because of the secular nature of the state. Over the years, however, that has changed as they've begun to exert their influence to transform Israel into a state that's more reflective of their religious ideals and values. I've arrived in the city of Beit Shemesh, a Haredi stronghold in Israel. I'm here to interview Neely Philip. Although she's a religious Jew, she's not ultra-Orthodox. She's fighting back against Haredi attempts to impose their religious ideals upon the non-Haredi residents of the city. It's funny, normally when we would do a shoot like this, we would get out of the car, shoot a lot of B-roll, but we've been told in no uncertain terms that if we get out of the car in these neighborhoods, we will be immediately attacked. How long ago did you guys move to Beit Shemesh? 15 years ago. And it was such a nice mix and diverse, and I, I really felt that this was such a healthy place to raise my children. But if I were to get out now for more than two minutes, I would be surrounded by kids screaming at me that I'm a whore and a slut. The kids? It's happened to me personally. They teach the kids to go out and scream shiksa and putza. This sign, this is the sign. It says, women are requested to refrain from passing or lingering on this sidewalk. The presence of women on this sidewalk is considered by the men here to be offensive. All right, let's keep, let's keep driving yeah. if you don't mind. I Sure. Cost too much. Yeah, they keep sniffing. Yeah, they're sniffing. This mall, this was built about 12 years ago, and the modesty police, they sabotaged the construction. They poured concrete down the pipes and they threatened the workers. The modesty police? They're a self designated uh, policing group that has decided that they are going to enforce the norms. You yourself have been attacked on a number of occasions. You said somebody threw a rock at your head. Yes. Um, people have spit on you. Yes. But it's not just women who have been attacked, but children as well. When my daughter was in second grade, the school was moved into this building. And one of the most extremist groups decided they wanted the building for themselves. They don't and want to mix in any way, no, no mingling at all. This was a nice building, and it was close enough to their neighborhoods. They were just starting to populate these buildings here. They would block the sidewalks, spitting at the girls, uh, screaming at them. They threw bags of urine at them. Bags of urine? It was absolutely disgusting. This is extreme, even by Haredi standards. They have their own law. They, they have their own law. I have to say, it sort of sounds like you're describing Iran. <laughs> No, you know? it's not Iran. I'm not afraid that someone's going to arrest me in the middle of the night. It's not Iran. The law is on my side. The courts are on my side. And so when people tell you that, you know, if this town is becoming unbearable, then why don't you move? It's our home. We don't want to give up on it so quickly. We don't feel that we should have to just by giving in to bullies. But that's not legitimate. It's not legitimate to ask that of me or expect that of me. It's Shabbat, the Sabbath, the Jewish day of rest. I've been invited to spend it at the home of a secular couple, Anat Teitelbaum and Danny Asayad, two architects who were born and raised in Jerusalem. I'm going to do it in the same style that my uh, father used to do it, okay. although I'm sec uh, secular and I'm not uh, really connected to it. 
ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, בורא פרי הגפן. You grew up in this house. What was it like when you were growing up? The street was completely secular, like all my... The whole block, I think. Yeah, but we are the only non-religious family in this street. It was street. left. Growing up, a completely secular neighborhood not far from here, that when I moved there in 98 or 99, there were no religious families. And seven years later, We moved out because every Shabbat, our neighbors would throw used diapers and rocks at our car. With the interviews, there is a fight between the side, and we are losing. If you're talking about demographics, yeah, you're losing. And do you think that most secular Jews feel that somehow the Haredi communities do not contribute? Do you all think that um, Haredi should serve in the military? No, my kid is 17. Yeah, next year he goes, he goes to the army. Yeah. And this guy doesn't go to the army. And my kid is going to face serious risk. I'm not going to sleep at night, but he's going to sleep great and get money from the government. Why? If we're a society which is united, then we should aim for, for people to take part in equally. We always complain about it that we are not unified and the Orthodox Jews has their rabbi and whatever he says they will do and they are unified. And we cannot do it because there's no secular rabbi. There's no secular <laughs> rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> been invited to the home of Shifra and her husband Shalom. Hi, Shifra. And you're Shira, right? Hi. As in most ultra-Orthodox families, Shalom does not work. He spends six days a week at the yeshiva studying the Torah. Like most Haredi women, it's Shifra who's the primary breadwinner in the household. She works full-time as a psychologist. She also cooks, she cleans, and she cares for their three children, Yehuda, Shira, and Shmuel, who has only recently begun his studies in the Torah. So let me ask you about the, the wall here. They're all great rabbis. So in a way, these rabbis are kind of role models for not just yes. you, but for your children. Yeah. And we left one empty spot there. And we tell our children, that's where you're going to be. Only Shifra's sons have a shot of making the wall. Women in the Haredim are forbidden from becoming rabbis. Her daughter will receive some schooling, and then, like her mother, she will be expected to marry young, to have children, and work full-time to support the family financially, so that her husband can devote his life to studying the Torah. I was born in the States. It is easier to live as a Haredi Jew over here than there, because there you, you have You're full of distractions. Would you like to see this state be a little bit more forceful in applying halakha? Yes, that should be the direction we should be taking. You know, when I talk to secular Israelis, I can't help but sense a, um, a kind of resentment. I don't think that attention is, is avoidable. If you claim ownership on this land, it's only because It, we, it says in the Bible that God gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same Torah gives you a whole bunch of other things that you got to do. I can't lie. I can't look a secular person in the eye and say, yeah, that's okay, you don't have to keep shops. That, that's okay. I can't lie. While Shifra prepares dinner, I take a break to walk Shalom back to Yeshiva for his evening study. How old is your oldest? He's uh, 11, 11 and a half. What, what kind of school does he go to? He, he goes to a yeshiva school, I would imagine, right? Right, right. His day starts at 7.30 and ends at 5.30. That's a 10-hour day. Does he also get the traditional secular education as well? The very basics, meaning uh, math. Of the 10 hours, one wow. hour will be on secular studies. Do you worry sometimes that should he choose for some reason to not follow um, you know, the Haredi lifestyle, that he, he won't be prepared for it? I'm not going to prepare him to leave something that I don't think he should be leaving. I can certainly understand the importance of Torah study for the ultra-Orthodox. But only one hour a day of secular studies? Does that mean that Israel is looking at a growing population 
who may not be able to find South America on a map, who may not know what the surface of Mars looks like, or the basics of human anatomy. And if that's the case, what does that mean for the future of this country? Back at the house, dinner is almost ready. I think we are set. I guess we're just waiting for your eldest. I think we're going to start, and Shmuel will join us. Some of Shifra and Shalom's relatives have arrived to share the meal. And finally, Shmuel returns, exhausted after a long day of Torah studies. The whole day we were thinking, OK, when Shmuel comes home, that's when the real <laughs> thing begins. Everyone was waiting for you. Shmuel, where is Shmuel? <laughs> Well, how was your day? We were able to learn. <laughs> yeah, you can't take that for granted. So what did you learn about today? Can you share? Um. Here, eat, eat something while you're eating, while you think about it. I feel like I've learned more about the Haridim in just those couple of hours than I have in all the books I've read something so beautiful about their partnership, working together to fulfill the Torah each in their own way. And yet, I could tell Shmuel was so exhausted at the dinner table. Ten hours of Torah study every day, except the Sabbath. And when I left, he picked up his Talmud because he had two more hours of study to go before bedtime. As a father of three sons, I have to be honest with you, my heart was breaking for Shmuel. I don't know. This is probably the most disputed piece of real estate in the world. The Jews call it the Temple Mount. For Muslims, it's Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary. It once housed the Temple of Jerusalem, but that was destroyed 2,000 years ago. All that remains of it is the Western Wall, the Kotel. Many Jews believe that the Messiah will not return until the Temple is rebuilt on this very spot. But that's a problem because currently it houses the Dome of the Rock, the third holiest site in all of Islam. Countless battles have been fought, countless lives lost for control over this holy space. Pindrus is a rabbi and a devout member of the ultra-Orthodox community. He's also the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Well, that's a view. <laughs> wow. This is the holiest place in the world. It brings me into tears. Do you understand the resentment that secular Israelis have sometimes about the Haredi community? That people say, well, you're taking, not giving. First of all, we think we're giving and not taking. When my son sits there for 12, 13 hours a day, right? And sometimes Reading 20, the Torah, 25 years. Studying the Torah. Studying it again and writing, finding out. He's not giving less to the future of the Jewish nation. He's tributing more than what the... I did when I was in the army with a rifle. Another issue is the role of women, um, particularly when it comes to this controversy that's been erupting over the last few years about the women at the wall. We're not against women. We're not trying to push out women. There's a difference between men and women by praying. That's the, the traditional Jewish way of doing it. And right, but whoever doesn't like it, let him go to pray somewhere else. No problem. Actually, there is a problem. As the only thing that remains of the Second Temple, the Western Wall, or Kotel, has become the holiest place for Jews to pray. The majority of the wall is designated for men only. Women may pray at a much smaller niche to the side. 
But there are a host of rules that they have to obey. They're not allowed to wear the traditional prayer shawl. They're not allowed to raise their voices. To be heard by the men praying on the other side is considered offensive. They're not allowed to wear tefillin, the little black boxes containing verses from the Torah that are worn by observant Jews. They're not allowed to read from or even touch the Torah. For decades now, a group of devout Jewish women have been struggling to change the status quo at the Kotel. They call themselves the Women of the Wall. Do you feel as though it's, um, it's, it's a threat to traditional Jewish values? No. We think the, member, uh, the women have their place, right? And we don't think they're less important. But when you're coming and trying to change the Jewish religion, I mean, that's not legitimate. You think okay? that's what they're doing? You're right. The wall is not uh, some uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, theater or some kind of mall, right? Western wall is a place to pray, right? And a place to pray, there's rules how Jews pray, right? They did that 100 years ago, 200 years mm -hmm. ago. We're doing our lives, our style of life. And, you know, by the end of the day, it worked. It worked for thousands of years, and it's going to keep on working. Despite how Deputy Mayor Pindris sees things, members of the women of the wall continue to challenge the constraints imposed upon them by the strictly orthodox authority that administers the Western Wall. Recently, the government of Israel tried to appease the women of the wall by creating an area next to Robinson's arch for them to hold their prayers. While some call this progress, many women in the movement do not see it that way. After all, Robinson's arch is more than 100 meters away from the Wailing Wall. It is not the Kotel. This is where the Haredim and even the mayor's office says, you all should pray. You know, we are technically at the wall, but it's not the Kotel. The Kotel's on that side of the bridge. Jews all over wanted to pray there. This is the place. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they cannot tell us just, you know, move, move over here. Move over here. <laughs> because it's, it's a feeling. It's, it's not actually uh, the stones. It's what you feel in your heart mm -hmm. to the place. This is a conflict that's been going on for 20 years, 27 right? years. 27 years. Yes. How did it begin? It began with a, a very small group of women that wanted to pray here with uh, uh, Talit, with Tfilin, uh, with Torah, the way the men do. And uh, they started to come here to the Kotel and the rabbis didn't know what to do with them. Actually, they threw them out. The government said that if they're going to let this small group of women to pray in the Kotel, uh, it's going to hurt the religious feeling of all the other prayers here, and it's a big interference for the place. So hurting feelings is an arrestable offense? Yeah. The whole message to the Jewish people, this is a place of unity, not a place of division. Yeah. So this isn't just a fight about the wall, this is a fight about Israel. I say if the Israeli society is not open to solve her own problems, it will never be open to solve other issues. are what's left of the original temple after the Romans destroyed it in the year 70, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews, casting the survivors out of the land of Israel for 2,000 years. In the Israeli narrative, the birth of Israel in 1948 is the return of the Jews back to their historic homeland. This is not the Israel of 2,000 years ago. Things are changed. It's a secular world. It's a democracy. It's struggling desperately to figure out what it even means to be a Jewish state and whether that's even possible in the 21st century. The Haredim don't want anything to change. But that's just impossible. Change is inevitable. That is it.
booming system. These are the Nanaks. And believe it or not, they're ultra Orthodox Jews. But not like any I've ever seen. Nanaks are Hasidic, a mystical branch of the Haredim. The movement began in the 80s and follows the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslau, who died more than 200 years ago. Theologically speaking, very little separates the Nanaks from their fellow Haredim. They follow a strict interpretation of the Torah. They too are exempt from military service. Their men also do not work. They are supported by their wives. They espouse a strict segregation of genders. But while most Haredi live in closed insular communities, the Nanaks are out in the open, interacting with the secular world. The Nanaks reject the traditional Haredi belief that you can only get close to God through prayer and the study of the Torah. They pray and study, but they also party. As you might imagine, most of the other Haredim are not fans of this upstart sect. There are only about a thousand Nanaks, a small fraction of the Haredi community, but their numbers are growing. You guys, you know, when you're when you're going around and, and playing this music and dancing around, what are you trying to do when you do that? First thing maybe is to raise happiness in the, in the people around us. Second thing, which is really important, is to to say, to, to reveal to the world, called Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman said about happiness, he said through happiness you could serve God, you could uh, be close to God, you could talk to God. Happiness is basic. It's like the beginning of everything. Um, would it be cool if I hung out with you guys? Yeah, for Can sure, for sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, let's go. <laughs> Ron and his crew have agreed to let me tag along with them as they perform their daily hafatza, or evangelizing. Did you come from a religious family? I came from a very non-religious family. And then one day I saw none of guys dancing, and I, and I was blown out of my mind. I said, wow. That's what I'm looking for. When I was in my teenagers, I started searching for my own unique personal path. And yeah, I found my way to Rabbi Nachman and uh, this path. Your parents are Orthodox. Yeah. What do they think about you as a, as a Nana? My brother is uh, sort of a rabbi here in Israel. He doesn't accept it as much as my parents. He's more like strict letter of the law. I, I came from a non-religious family, but I felt like my heart is not there. Something is missing. And I remember driving with my friend, my two motorcycles on the, on the road, and then uh, on one junction we stopped. And I remember there is a sticker, uh, maybe it's, you have it here, and it's, it's a sticker say, It's a big mitzvah to be happy always. And I thought to myself, oh, this rabbi knows what he's, what he's talking about, you know? So I decided to check it out, okay, who is this rabbi? So he told me, oh, he died 200 years ago. <laughs> One of the things that I've been noticing since being here and talking to different people, both secular and, and, and the Haredim, I find a big gulf between them. Do you guys feel like you can kind of be a bridge between these two groups? Uh, not one. His teachings are for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Muslim or whatever. Everyone can talk to God. He so speaks don't English. It's OK. Do you guys feel as though you are um, changing, changing Israel from the ground up? We are trying. We are trying. Okay, ready for you. First thing is a matam with a pon pon on the top. It's like an antenna. How you say? The antenna. Yeah, antenna. So you can get a better connection, you know. Okay. So. Na na nachma nachman meuma. Yeah, exactly. 
unlike any Jewish worship that I have ever experienced. We were stopping traffic in the middle of the streets. No one seemed to mind, except the Haredi, of course. And the entire time we kept singing over and over and over again, Na, Na, Nachman, Nachman, Neyuman, a Kabbalistic formula based on the letters of Rabbi Nachman's name and the place of his death. There was no wall, no Torah, no yeshiva, no separation, no do's and don'ts. Just pure, unadulterated happiness. While Rabbi Nachman is buried in Uman, Ukraine, the rabbi who took his teachings and turned it into a movement, Rabbi Odesser, is buried here in Jerusalem, and his grave has become a sacred place for the Nanaks. I think Rabbi Nachman once said that God is not with the person who is sad. He said, Kadosh Baruch Hu hates sadness. God hates sadness. He hates sadness. But it's hard to be happy all the time, isn't it? I wish I would stay happy all the time. <laughs> I'm trying you to be happy. You practice, yeah, you try yeah. really I hard. I want to be happy yeah. all the time, I'm really trying. I think the impression that a lot of people have about, you know, the Haridim in general is that they're very dour. And then, you know, you see you guys and it's a completely different Impression. It's true, it's true. Each one has to find his way how to connect to Hashem. It's like it's a process. Of course, we must keep halacha. But inside the halacha, we need to find our way. There's a lot of way. diversity, and you we can need... find your own, okay. yeah, your own way. When you say the words, na, na, nachma, nachman, me'uman, what, what, does it, what does it mean for you? Whenever you say this, you know, this song, na, nach, nachma, nachman, me'uman, you, you, it's like fills you with light. You and all the world. After a long day of spreading the message of Rabbi Nachman, we headed down to the woods for some alone time with God. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Although we used the same prayer book as the ultra-Orthodox, we did not pray in the same way. Rabbi Nachman, he loved being alone. He, he, he would go out into the woods or he would go out into the lake and he would just shout to God. It was a dude. It was a dude. Yeah, it was a dude. Uh, and to it be means alone. To be alone. Like making a personal relationship with, with, uh, with God. Talk to Hashem in your own words. Tell him thank you for all the good things that uh, you feel that he gave you. Okay. Uh, ask him for things that you want to get. It's good to do it. It's good to do it. All right. And this idea that what God really wants for you is to be happy. It's in many ways so foreign to my experience of the ultra-Orthodox. But maybe they're onto something. God knows with everything going on here in, in Israel, a little happiness might not be such a bad idea. All right, now go away so I can have my alone time with Hashem.
spend enough time in Israel and it's hard to be optimistic about the future. The conflict between the ultra-Orthodox and the secular Jews does not seem to be diminishing. There's no question that the Haredim are changing Israel. But when I look at the Nanaks and the way that they have made ultra-Orthodox spirituality their own, I can't help but think that maybe it's Israel that's changing the ultra-Orthodox. And in that, there's hope. everybody and that there is a force in the world that can bring out this good in all of us I believe that God created the world with the goal of bringing it to ultimate goodness and he kindly gave us the opportunity and the privilege to be part of it I believe all people are interconnected and I believe that actually religion is the big divider <laughs> I believe people will destroy each other in the name of their gods. I believe in the power of the person and in the power of God. The people have to believe in themselves and then they'll believe in God. I believe, even though I'm not perfect, with the power of Rabbi Nachman I can get as close as possible to Hashem. <laughs> You're Jewish? No. No, your mom's not Jewish? No. I feel Jewish today. 